God, in our quietness, we've been lifting three people who have requested prayer here, and we are placing them at your feet, dear Heavenly Father, and we know when we do that, truly, their needs can be met because you are the powerful creator in this universe. And we know that you'll help them get healed. We'll help them get through their life and help them have their strength come back to them. Continue to watch over them. Continue to watch over all of us. And we're always also concerned about Pastor Trace. Keep her safe as she is going through her vacation time. We know truly that you will. Glad for that. Watch over also. We know we just had a wonderful 4th of July weekend where we are concerned about many things, but the greatest thing we were giving joy for was the fact that we live in a nation here that's free. And we're thankful for all the soldiers and people who truly gave their time were simply for the reason that they want to keep us free. And we are thankful for their effort. And as we watch the fireworks, wherever we were, or what, whatever time, we know they were celebrating the freedom that we have. Freedom that we can do whatever we want. Truly, God, we're thankful for this country. We lift it up and place it into your care, knowing, dear Heavenly Father, that you will help all the leaders if they'll just come to you. Bless us now. Bless our thoughts and bless our actions. And this day, we commit all these prayers that have been said openly and those that may have been said quietly to you through your Son's name, the Son who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Okay. Praise team. Seek one. 
is true. Seek what is true. Speak what is morning. How was everyone this morning? Was you here last Sunday to hear the quartet? Did you enjoy it? Would you like to see another one in the future? Just think about it and uh, I'm doing some work on it. Maybe we can get someone else if you want. How many of you remember the cartoon, I think it was Popeye? Didn't he say the words, I am what I am? And he used to say that? Yeah. Well, listen to this. The Bible says, for grace are we saved. It's not of ourselves. Because it is a gift of God. Start over, would you? I forgot to put my ears in. Gotta be wired for 220. Okay, let's try it again. I am what I am. Because of his grace, through one spotless lamb, died in my place. All my sins are forgiven. My past is erased. I am what I am because of his grace. I can stand here and tell you what I used to be. I could tell of the change that's come over me but the lord sent his grace when he died on the tree so i'll let the blood jesus shed speak for me i am what i am because of his grace for one spotless lamb he died in my place all my sins are forgiven my past is erased. I am what I am because of His grace. I was lost and undone. Now I'm found and fulfilled. God traded His Son for my shame and my guilt. Now I am His child, no longer sin slave. His mercy has made me what I am today. I am what I am because of His grace. For one spotless lamb, He died in my place. All my sins are forgiven. My past is erased. I am what I am. I'm saved as they. I am what I am because of his grace for one spotless lamb he died in my place all my sins are forgiven the past is erased I am what I am because of his grace what I am I'm saved by grace. I am what I am. The last of His grace. I'm saved by grace.
Thank you, Dave, very much. So, let us stand now for the reading of the scripture. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be t humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of God from the long ago for the people of God today. Be to God. You may be seated. We've had probably a celebration, each of you, in some way for July 4th, and I hope you did. I know it was good whenever you could, and I hope you had a family time. It's wonderful that we have a free country that we can live in. And we need to be thankful also for those who gave their time in the service so we can have a free country. Let us pray. God, bless us as we go through the rest of this service. Touch us and may our hearts be open. And the word said that can minister to all of us. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning. I'm not going to ask you to definitely respond to it because I don't want to have to make you uh, confess too much here this morning. How many of you have ever traveled faster than the speed that is posted along the side of the roads? Hmm? I see some of them shaking their heads. I mean, if I would ask, really get touchy here, and if I would ask you and make you put up your hands, how many of you would have to do that? <laughs> well, I see hands already. I didn't even ask you. <laughs> All right. I won't say who they were. So now I assure you that this is not one of the holier than thou statements from a pastor, for I've gotten several speeding tickets myself. And that's a confession too. But I lived in a town once that was known as a speed trap. And why was it a speed trap? The police in that time would place a police car at the one end of the town on the main street, which is a four-lane highway, which just begged for you to go fast on. And they put that police car at one end of the town. But sitting in the, that police car would be a mannequin in a police uniform. Now, what happened? At the other end of the town, there would be the true police car with the true policeman sitting there with his radar gun, and there was always one or two cars pulled over in this town. That town that I lived in had no city income tax because it didn't need. It got enough money from, from the speeding tickets to pay all its bills. Now, afterwards, I'll tell you what town if you really want to know. <laughs> so, 
But we all know if suddenly the traffic in front of us slows down and that we had better do the same thing, for up ahead is a speed trap waiting for you. In one state, they were experiencing with this idea of zapping your car with radar and then having another police car pull you over farther down the road. Another state was trying to slow down their traffic by having an airplane flying over some of the major highways and they would zap you down and get your speed and your license plate and then a month later or even less than a month you would get this ticket in the mail. How many speeds, how fast you were going, where you were when you did this and all that. But they liked the idea because there was no messy problems with troopers pulling over belligerent and sometimes dangerously angry drivers. But those are just a few of the many different types of speed traps that we can get into when we're driving our cars. But there are many other traps that we can find ourselves getting caught into uh, if we aren't watching, especially as we live our lives. Traps like, uh, do, nobody's going to notice when I eat that last donut. <laughs> or nobody is going to notice if I, you know, take that one last swig or glass of wine or something like that. Nobody's going to notice. And the list could go on. You could tell some of the other ones, the traps that you get yourself caught into because of what may have be happening. And these traps can go even with our Christian life if we aren't careful. And one of the traps where it can really happen was in our scripture this morning where there are several traps there. And the traps that are there can destroy our prayer life and destroy our Christian life if we don't watch out what we are doing. Because some of the traps that are there in that scripture can destroy our connection to God completely. Now, if your prayer life has been a little sparse lately, if it seems your prayers are useless or a waste of time, maybe you have fallen into some of these traps. Awareness of them can help to avoid them so that the prayers will have more meaning and more, will give us richer levels of connection to our God. Now let me mention to, all, to you what are some of the prayers that you get out of this traps that you get out of this scripture. The first trap is a trap of misguided misdirection, I call it. It seems to me we must always maintain an awareness of the one to whom you are praying to. Are you really praying to God or simply to yourself? What is happening? This morning scripture tells us what was it? The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. Well, another translation puts it this way. He prayed a prayer to himself. Well, if, whether it's to himself or about himself, either case, we have misguided and misdirected prayer. Too often we do what the Pharisees did. We pray about ourselves. And somehow or other, as we do that, we don't think we need any help. We don't think that God can be there to help us or give us the encouragement we need. We live our life depending on only on ourselves. We think with our own smarts, we can get through this. Or with our own abilities, when we pray to God, we address him with our own abilities. Yes, we are praying to God. We address him with our lips, but secretly we believe in our own heart that we'll find some kind of internal gumption, the talent, and the courage to resolve all our own problems without any outside influence from God. 
If this is the case, then we have misguided just as much as the Pharisee did. We need to be like the little Johnny who went to a prayer meeting with a request. Would the group pray for his sister that the Spirit would lead her to change her life and her life sing and to begin to read the Bible again? That was his request to the prayer meeting. Well, he said, well, sure, we'll pray for your sister and that she'll start reading the Bible and all that. And so they sat down and they were praying. They prayed for about 10 or uh, maybe 15 minutes and that's about all what and suddenly Johnny got up and walked out of the prayer meeting. And one of the persons that was in the prayer meeting, where are you going? Uh, we're still praying for your sister. It would be rude to leave now. And Johnny looked at him and you've prayed for my sister for 15 minutes. I'm going home because I think God has had plenty of time to work with her right now. Johnny knew that prayer to God could work. He knew that. And Jesus also knew this because he deeply prayed to God and not to himself. And Jesus prayed for God's will to be done. Jesus acknowledged God's sovereignty even in trying circumstances. Jesus knew that on his last night that he was here in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed that God would be his guide and that the prayers would be directed to God and to God alone is what his prayers were. And the Pharisees needed to learn that when you make a prayer. He needed to learn that because what was he saying? According to the scripture, he was saying he stood up and prayed about himself. He didn't pray to God and God alone. And sometimes we need to learn that too. Well, but our Pharisee friend falls into another trap. The Pharisee and the tax collector are both in the temple together. One of them is standing at the front of the temple and the other is in the back of the temple. I had a picture one time. I don't know what happened to it. I wish I'd never gotten rid of it had a picture of showing the, the Pharisee on all his vulgarity in the front of the temple. And he was praying and going with his hands like this. But there also in that picture was in the very back of the temple was a tax collector on his knees pounding his chest in prayer. They are both in prayer, these two men. Both in prayer. But the Pharisee falls into a trap of comparison. Comparison to others, especially that tax collector. And this is a trap that can creep into all of us if we don't be careful. It can be a, oh Lord, I'm glad that I am not a bank robber or a drug addict or I don't beat my wife, or the list could go on, or a drunk. I'm an all-around good person, we might say. I attend church, you know, regularly, not like those who never attend. The trap is, is that we assume that we must compare ourselves to other in our Christian life. One man rewrote the Pharisee, prayer this way. I thank thee, Lord, that I am a North Carolinian and not from Virginia or even from South Carolina. There are mountains of conceit in South Carolina. In fact, I'm from Eastern Carolina, for no gentleman was ever born in the West. Especially, Lord, I thank you that I am a Southerner, and not a J Yankee. For there are many things which can be endured, but that would be the most impossible to endure to be a Yankee. Well, now the trap, of course, is that we assume it is others that we must be compared to. But God's and Christ's reality is 
that we must compare ourselves to ourselves, not to somebody else. The comparison, friends, must always be between ourselves, ourselves, and ourselves alone, and God's standards. That's where the comparison must come for each of us. The Ten Commandments, for example, how do they begin? We must behave, and we must believe, behave, and treat each other. That's how the Ten Commandments simply go. And all with the understanding that how we behave with others reflects our relationship with God. That's what the Ten Commandments tell us to do. And they are still valid rules. More, those commandments have nothing to do with whether you have kept them better than Susie who lives down the street or whether you have kept them better than Bob who lives down the street and sits in the pew next to you. But how have you kept them is what this part of it. How have you kept the Ten Commandments? A writer, Don Henderson, reports encountering this I am better than you are attitude when he ran into a middle-aged man in a police station. In Huntington, Kentucky, and the man called out to Henderson, Are you saved, brother? And when Henderson didn't respond, he says, I just got out of jail. I was arrested because I was drunk. A prison a chaplain for the police officers came and prayed for me. And I have a better relationship than you do because I have been saved. Give me five dollars and I'll get down on my knees and pray for you and for your salvation. We all need to be saved. I, I will pass the word to the man upstairs about your conversion. And Henderson said, well, that's all fine and good, but why do you need the five dollars? The man says, well, I pray a lot better after I've had a few beers. It can become so easy, doesn't it, to think that we are superior to others. How thankful, how, how flawed we can be, assuming that our spirituality places us closer to God than the person next door. What a trap that is. And it can impede and cripple our entire prayer life. Rich or poor, supposedly spiritual or not, biblical scholar or biblical illiterate, we all need to pray and work for God. And the question is not, am I better or worse than my neighbor? Rather, the question is, with your prayer is, oh God, what do you want me to do? Well, our Pharisee falls into one more trap as he prays. He's arrogantly confident about himself. He is so certain that he is better, and he believes this based on what he does. And he gets caught in this ego center evidence of his life. But listen to what he says. Again, I go back to the scripture. I thank you, God, I am not like other men, robbers, evil doers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice, I fast a week, twice a week, and give a tenth of all I get. Rather than asking God for guidance, the Pharisee spends time telling the Almighty God how much better I am than everybody else. And his prayer is not so much the needed openness to God to come into my life and to help me and support me. What is it? It's a report that he's been a good boy. In fact, you could say, oh, what a good boy I've been. 
is what he's saying to God. And that's a trap that can be for all people. Thank you, God, for using me to do all that work in the church. What a shame that more and more people don't volunteer to do the work as I do. And I am grateful that I am able to sing in the choir and help all those monotones to get as good a voice as I have. Compare this to the prayer of that tax collector. He was a hated person in Jesus' time. And what does he say? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. A simple, direct prayer. Asking for mercy. Asking God indirectly. Lord, use me for your work. Change my ways. Save me. Show me your ways. Show me how to live with you. And Jesus says, the exalted will be humble and the humble will be exalted. God is aware of what we do and what we do not do. A laundry list of achievements for the kingdom and for God's almighty approval is not needed. An open heart for God to come in is. If anyone could have experienced or expected God to recognize his brilliance, it would have been Abraham Lincoln. And when I was reading his memoirs, I really became true to, to that feeling. There was a man who wrote about our 16th president. He had been at, at President Lincoln's house for th three weeks. And he, one night, it was right before the Battle of Bull Run, he couldn't sleep. And so he was walking around the White House. And he heard the suddenly voices or kind of like a very low voice, and it was the president. And so he decided to walk up, and maybe there's something that he could do to help the president. And he said, I saw a sight that I've never forgotten. Never forgotten. The tall chief executive of the United States was kneeling on the floor before an open Bible. He did not know I had overheard his agonizing supplications, but I heard him plead these words. O thou great God who heard Solomon in the night when he prayed and cried out for wisdom, hear me. I cannot lead these people. I cannot guide the affairs of this country without your help. O oh Lord, hear me and save the nation. Lincoln knew that relying on God and God alone was a way to avoid those prayer traps that I've been talking about. And so did the tax collector when he went down on his knees and said, God, save me, a sinner. And so can you and I, when we know that we simply must go to God and say, Lord, here I am, forgive me. Use me. I am your child. And on you alone will I depend. You know, the ancient tax collector in this pa passage of Scripture, I think, knew how to avoid all prayer traps. And why? Because he opened himself up to God. And his words, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, 
could be a challenge for all people, all of us here, and even for all the leaders and all people around the world. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. For when you pray that prayer and open yourself up completely for God, then, you know what? You're binding yourself to the Almighty God if you will just listen to what he says. If you listen to what he says. Let us pray. God, this day, let us listen to you. Let us listen to you fully in all that you want to tell us. And let us be in attitude of prayer as we continue to lift up to you all thoughts and all ways. Amen. Let us stand now for our final, final hymn, our final thought from our prayer scheme. Let us stand. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are. my heart of oh God make it ever true change my heart of oh God may I be like you you my heart of oh God make it ever true change my heart of oh Now as you leave this day, truly know that heart of yours needs to be opened to God's leading. And we know when it is, God will truly change your life in so many different ways. And it will all be for the good. May God be with you until we meet again. Amen.